extremes, a lesson in extremes. Uh, everyone, everyone here knows, understands the concept of extremes. And let me tell you, uh, there, I, there, I don't think there's a greater study in extremes than every two to four years in this country, right? Every two to four years, we have an election cycle that comes through, and you see a lesson in extremes. You've got, you've got people on this side of the aisle and this side of the aisle, and, and they would have you believe that everything we believe is right and everything they believe is wrong. There's an extreme. We've, we've got all the answers, and they've got none of the answers. And it's, it, it goes both ways. Everybody's, everybody feels that way, and it seems that every two to four years, this nation is polarized. And that's, there's nothing more extreme than polarization. So everybody here understands that concept of extremes. And that's just one example. Uh, the world record for heat is 134 degrees Fahrenheit. You think about 134 degrees. Found out that in, I believe, where we're going, it's going to be 113, 113 degrees. I'll let you know how I, how I, how I do, because I don't hold out much hope. <laughs> 113 degrees. The world record for heat is 134 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was recorded in Death Valley, California. Now, the world record for cold is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit, recorded in Antarctica. Now, I don't know why anybody would want, who would be there to record that, but somebody was there to record that. Uh, a man named Robert Wadlow, you've probably seen his picture in many things. He, was a, he was the, held the record of the world's tallest person in recorded history now at 8 feet 11 inches. And he showed no signs of slow growth even when he, even when he passed. He passed because of health issues, because of that, that gigantism, as it's called. Uh, he had health issues, and that's what he passed from. But he was still growing even at his death. And the other extreme is a man named Chandra Bangi of Nepal. He's the shortest documented adult at only 21 inches tall. I believe he's since passed since this was recorded, but 21 inches tall. Talking about extremes. Here's this, and they had a pictures of him at one time where you had these, the tallest and the shortest, and you see the, 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 just the huge difference in between uh, um, extremes. And then you have people that hold views that are extreme ends of the spectrum. Even wanting to live in different, you got people that they would be they're they're happiest living in a walk up in New York City where they're packed in and just crowded, uh, and other cities throughout the world where there's just so many people they're just so densely populated. There are people who want to live right in the middle of it. Man, they love the idea of living right in the middle of everything. And then you got people who said, "I want to move as far away." Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched those shows. Those um, there's a, a, a bush people in Alaska. And then they live as far away from civilization by themselves, alone. You have to take a plane, and then you have to get off the plane, and then you hike for so many, and then you take a, this and that and the other. And it's, People live in extremes. There are people who live in the Antarctic, and there are people who live in California right next to Death Valley. Just That's the way we are, the idea of an extremes. And we understand that concept of extremes. Well, you know, the Bible alludes to extremes as well. There are extremes that we find in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see where Paul, when he's writing to the uh, church at Corinth, he's, ex he's, he's reminding them what love means to Christians and to God. Because love, love should mean the same thing to us as it means to God, but it doesn't always. We take the, the definition of love and we want to change it a little bit. We want to make it more closely resemble what we have in mind. But unfortunately, when we do that, a lot of times we go to an extreme. And, and Paul talks about this idea of extremes and how that can happen even in the church, even when we're talking about something that should mean the same to everybody. should mean the same to all of us. But we see where extremes come into play. Now, 1 Corinthians is known as what? The love chapter. Okay, that's what we always talk about. It's always described as the love chapter. Um, it's also anchored in the belief that while other things may be good and proper and sometimes necessary, we've got to remember that at the core, love is at the core and is the foundation for all of these things. Love is at the foundation. But unfortunately, a lot of times that, that extreme nature, of extremes of human nature come into play. So let's start real quick. Let's start at verses 1 and 2. All right. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Now, I, I want to I tell you this. I find this very interesting. If you ever want a lesson in why we don't use musical instruments in church, this is, to me, this is one of the greatest reasons. What does God look at it? A noisy gong, clanging cymbal. What does God want to hear? Does he want to hear all these musical instruments where they may be played well, they may not be played well, all of these things? Does he want to hear that, or does he want to hear 
the voice coming from us as his perfect instrument. Well, I'll, I'll, that's, just a, that's a lesson for another time, but I always found it interesting that that's how it's described. Sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, a noisy cymbal, it doesn't mean what it needs to mean. But anyway, let's, 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 go, to, let's go to our point. Speaking in tongues was an early part of early Christian worship. It was. Uh, the Holy Spirit gave gifts as to who you know, to God had, had, had divined for these particular people. Each one of them had a gift that was specific to that person. And it was specific to the work, and that was important. And it was an important part of early Christian worship, this idea of speaking in tongues. Not gibberish. It was something that had a specific meaning. It was to be translated, and it was to be explained to the congregation. Now, through these tongues, we also have to remember that important truths and prophecy was issued to the church by God. And so coveted was the ability to speak in tongues that the Apostle Paul had to clarify in chapter 14 that while speaking in tongues was important, it was a gift of the Holy Spirit, therefore it was important, that it wasn't the most important of the gifts. As a matter of fact, if this gift was used, it wasn't used in the right way. It wasn't, it wasn't a useful gift at all. It was a point of contention for the church. But even prophecy was to be desired more than speaking in tongues. But that, doesn't, that, that didn't change the fact that there were people who wanted that gift of tongues so badly. Even to the point where we see even today there are those who believe this idea of speaking in tongues. But we know, of course, that that comes from man. That does not come from God. That gift has passed away. But Paul lets them know that even if a Christian had this coveted ability to speak in tongues, if love was not the guiding force behind this speaking in tongues, what was it? It was noise. It was nothing more than noise. Let me, let's, let's bring this to this. Let's bring us to this standpoint. If we could come here and we could, we could sing... We could sing with the most beautiful songs. We could lift our voice in praise, and it could be just beautiful. Someone on the outside could be listening to us and say, well, man, they've got a trained choir in there. It's, it's beautiful. We could have the most eloquent prayers, the most, most beautifully worded prayers. And I appreciate the prayers, by the way, Brother Richard. Uh, I, I, I appreciate those prayers. And it was a beautiful prayer, but let's, let's, let's be honest. If love is not in Brother Richard's heart as he's standing up and he's leading us in that prayer, that prayer doesn't go anywhere. It remains here with us. Everything that we do, we could take this communion, this, this precious communion of Jesus Christ, we could, we could break the bread and we could drink the cup, but if love is not our guiding force behind the things that we do here, all we're doing is eating a meal, and a very meager meal at that. It won't make any difference in our, in our lives if love is not at the heart of everything that we've done. Okay, so let's, let's continue this on. The gift was of no use if love was not the guiding factor behind it, if it wasn't the guiding force. Love for God and love for each other. That was essential. And that shows, that, that's, that's the point that Paul is trying to make to the church at Corinth. The reason he's trying to tell them this is because this is a problem that they're having. They're getting caught up in the gift rather than the guiding force behind the gift. The gift was given to them because God loved them enough to give them this gift. But they weren't using the gift in love for each other. They were doing it so they could be boastful. Well, I have the gift of prophecy. Well, I have the gift of tongues. I have the gift of healing. I have all of these gifts. And that was the problem. The love wasn't there. And he had to warn them. If love is not at the heart of it, it's of no use. All you're doing is sitting around and making noise. Because that's all it means. And now, like he says this, you've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Does, does, does a musical instrument have a voice? Now, I'm not talking about in, the, in, the, in the, uh, uh, a figurative sense, but does a, does, a, does a cymbal have a voice? No, it doesn't have a voice. It has a sound. And that's all we've become if love is not at the heart of our worship. If love is not at the heart of what we do here, all we're doing is making noise, and it doesn't avail anybody anything. The closest thing I can think of is speaking from this pulpit. I can deliver a well-thought-out sermon. I like to think I give well-thought-out sermons. But I can give, out the most well, they can, I can give you the most well-thought-out sermon with all of the verses, all of the, all of the uh, research that's gone into it, all of these things. I can stand up here and I can say it in, in a very smooth... And listen, do we not see people do that? Do we not see people who they deliver? Boy, it's, it just comes off of the tongue so smooth. It's like their mouth is filled with honey. It's, just, it's delivered in such a such a uh, yeah, easy fashion and you're almost lulled to sleep by listening to it because it so comes off the rolls off the tongue so easily but if love is not at the heart of that if, in the heart of that man who's standing before you giving those words then all I'm up here doing is making noise 
That's all it is. Noise. If love is not the heart of what we do. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Now the reason that the Holy Spirit was given to the early church, the, re- the reason it had the miraculous uses that it had was because it was to guide them into all knowledge. It was to guide them into all truth so they could understand these things. And here he says, even though I have the gift of prophecy, and even if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so what? So that I could remove mountains. We've heard this before. Christ spoke of this idea of the love or this faith that can move mountains. He said, this is the kind of faith I want you to have. Faith like the mustard seed. Tiny, tiny little mustard seed that grows up into this huge tree that birds can even come and they can, they can lighten the branches. He said, even if you have that kind of faith, tiny but grows into something huge, even if you have the faith that could, that could move mountains, and he gives them that example. Take, you can say to this mountain, be pulled up and thrown into the sea. Even if I have the faith that can move mountains, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. Now, I don't think you could get a greater extreme than being someone who has faith that can move mountains. You're talking about two huge extremes. You're talking about two great extremes. Here you have someone who has the gift of prophecy. They have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and all the miraculous gifts that came along with the Holy Spirit during the first century church. Here you have this man who has the capability of speaking in tongues has the capability of healing, has the capability of, of uh, prophecy, and all of these things. And they have the faith that can move mountains, all of these things. But there's a component there. And if that component is not there, you're on the opposite extreme completely. If love is not that binding factor in, that, in those gifts, in their use, in their proper use, if love's not there, then you are nothing. And I can't think of a greater extreme. Because you can imagine there are those in the early church, as there are today in the church, There are today in the church, not here, but elsewhere. There are those who believe that because they are who they are and what they are, that they somehow are in an exalted position. But we understand that no matter where they are, no matter what position they may achieve, no matter what they they think they are, because they do not have love, they are, in the eyes of God, nothing. And I can't think of a greater extreme. And I can't think of a greater extreme that I want to be on the opposite side of. You know, I would rather have the least of the gifts. I would rather be the least in the church. I would rather be the least in all of these things, but have love and avoid that extreme of being nothing. Because listen, when you're nothing, I can't think, there's nothing less that you can be. You can't go any further down than being nothing. But if you don't have love, that's exactly where we are. Now, remember what Paul was saying about the idea of the gift of prophecy. And it's, it's not an idea, it's, it's a fact. Remember what Paul was saying about the gift of prophecy being even more desirable than the gift of tongues. The need for love even trumps that. It still trumps even that. Faith that moves mountains. Now, we've heard that before, right? I've heard that before. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 19 and 20. Matthew 17, verses 19 and 20. It tells us, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. Now, I'm not sure why they came to him privately, but I I think it was the idea of they were embarrassed. And and the reason being that they had tried to cast out this demon, they were unable to do so. It could have been kind of an embarrassing affair. They want to find out, you know, if if we're falling short in some way, we don't want to be in front of everybody when we find out exactly why it is we couldn't do this. But the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it or cast the demon out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, thinking of that, who would not want that kind of faith? Who would not be, who would not be open to having that measure of faith? The idea, not just the idea of having that kind of power that you could move a mountain. Now, Christ is figuratively speaking of a mountain. He's not literally speaking of a mountain. He's figuratively speaking of a mountain. Because let, let, let's, and, and the point is this. What we have to look at is what, the, the way Christ speaks. Remember, he asked an example. He asked a, 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 the, the people who would criticize him. He said, is it more difficult to forgive sins or to heal? They said, well, to forgive sins. He said, I can do both. I can both heal this man and I can forgive his sins. What he's telling us here, when he talks about the faith that could move mountains, he said, 
what's more difficult, to move a mountain or to be pleasing to God? To move a mountain or to do this? To move a mountain or to do this? He said, if you can achieve this, if you can achieve the spiritual things, the physical things are of nothing. You don't need to worry about the physical things. And that's why he brings in this concept, this idea, this figurative nature of moving a mountain. He said, what's more difficult to do, have this mountain of sin removed from you or to actually physically uproot a mountain? Well, without Christ, what's more difficult? Have our sins forgiven. It would be easier to move a mountain than it would be to remove the sin from our life. But because of Christ, of course, we can have that mountain of sin removed. So he's asking this in a figurative fashion. You will say to this mountain, be moved from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you because of your faith in me. Now, to be known as a Christian who is known for their faith, I can't think of a greater, if when we're to pass from this life, even if we're known for this now, to pass from this life and to be known as a Christian who is full of faith, I can't think of a greater eulogy for any New Testament Christian. That was a person, that was a brother, that was a sister who was a faithful Christian. They were full of faith. They were the one that Jesus is speaking of. They had the kind of faith that could move mountains. Now, according to the Lord now, according to, according to the Lord, even if we had that kind of faith that was able to move a mountain, if we don't have love, then we are literally nothing. There's nothing to us. We're hollow. We're a shell. Even if we had that faith but did not have love. So we've got two extremes here, don't we? We've got faith that moves mountains. We've got coveted spiritual gifts that mark us as a true child of God. And we've got what? Nothing. That's what we've got. Pull up our next slide, if you would. All right. So these are our two options. This is what we have. And this, these are still the options that are open to us today. This is, still what's, this is still what's available to us. As Paul was speaking to the church in Corinth, he's speaking to us. We can have faith that moves mountains, coveted spiritual gifts that mark us as a true child of God, and without that component of love, what do we have? Next slide. Nothing. So we have to ask ourselves this. Where are we? Where are we? Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm confident in my faith. I, I have knowledge. I've got everything that I need. I've got the Holy Spirit that's, that's working in my life. I've got all of these things. So we need to examine ourselves because there's one part of that, there's one part of that uh, equation that must be in our lives or else everything that we say about ourselves in our introspective looking at ourselves, if that's not there, then in spite of all that we have, in spite of all that we are, in spite of all that we think we are, we're nothing in the eyes of God. I don't want to be nothing in the eyes of God because I can't think of a smaller thing to be than nothing in the eyes of God. Even if I'm great in the eyes of the world, it won't avail me of one thing. The only thing that can, should concern me is how I look to God. All right. So how do we reconcile these extremes? How do we reconcile these two extremes? Well, it's simple. We underpin everything that we do, say, and attempt. We underpin it with love. It's at the heart of everything that we do. Every word that comes out of our mouth, every deed that we do, every thought that we think, everything should come through that filter of love. It should all go through this, this I, I think of this idea, um, I don't know if you've ever watched these, um, these shows where it talks about how things are made. And I watched one that was talking about, it was a, uh, candy, uh, a candy thing, it wasn't M&M, but it was a, the kind that, it, was a, it had a coating on the outer shell. And it, I watched this thing and it was fascinating to watch it go through this, this process. But everything that came off of, that, uh, off of that assembly line went down to this little vat, and it stayed underneath this, this pool of whatever it was, this shell, and it passed through, and it was in there for a period of time so they could get really wrapped up and enrobed in whatever it was, this, this candy shell. And it would come out the other side, and I thought, you know, it, before it went in, it wasn't really that attractive. It really wasn't something that I probably would want to eat. But when it came out on the other end, it really just looked really good. And I think of that when I think about how we live our lives and the things that we do and everything that we say and everything that we think, every action, every thought, every deed, all goes through that little pool. And everything that we do needs to go in, it, in, in, in the concept of it's enrobed in love. And when we do all of these things, when we, everything that we say, everything we think, everything is filtered through this love, and it's, it's encapsulated in that when it comes out on the other end, it's pleasing. And that's when we get out of this extreme about being nothing or being something in the eyes of God. 
You know, because we may not have the gift. We may not have this gift. We may not have this ability. We may not have this place in the church, but when we have love, we're something in the eyes of God. God's pleased with us. He looks at it and he says, I'm not disappointed here. I see what I'm looking for. You know what? And I find that, once again, the idea of you've been faithful in a few things, I'm going to make you ruler over many things. You've done the small things. You've gotten where you're supposed to be. You're doing the, you're doing the basics. You're doing exactly what I want you to do. And you're doing it in a sense of love for your fellow Christians. You're doing it in a sense of love for the world. And what I'm, what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to give you a little bit more. And I'm going to add a little bit more to you. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to give you even more. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make you so that you'll, you'll, once again, the idea of being blessed to the point where it's overflowing. It's tamped down and it's still overflowing. That's what's going to happen to us when we do everything with a sense of love behind our actions. Now, this comes even more into focus in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, one of the most harmful beliefs of the Christian is that a good deed is good in and of itself, or that they stand alone. Now, verse 3 kind of blows that belief, it blows that out of the water. If I do not have love when I do this great service, it will do me no spiritual good. Now, I can go and I can serve food in a soup kitchen. I can go and give clothes to the poor. I can go and do all of these things. And you know what? If I do that without a sense of love, the people are still going to be fed. People are going to still have clothing. All of the good things for these people, the people are still going to derive the benefit from having these things done for them or the help that they receive. But it's not going to profit me one thing. Not one thing. Now, think about that. How many people are going to go to their reward or punishment thinking we've done all of these great things. I've been a part of so many things that have blessed so many people, but because they did it for the glory and adulation of man so that they could be put up on a pedestal and they can receive certificates and plaques and awards and ribbons and all these things, their name in the paper, because they did it for these reasons, it's not going to spiritually avail them of anything. It's not going to help them at all. The people will still derive the benefit, but they won't. The very person who needs it really more than the people who needed all the stuff. They're the ones that need it. They're the ones that need to stand justified before God. But because they didn't have love, it's as if they didn't do anything. They may have well stayed home for all the good it's going to do them spiritually. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, what? Exactly what we said. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. It won't avail you of anything. It won't help at all. And believe me, we are expected to stand before God and say that we have been of service. But when we stand before God and say, well, Lord, I was of service, even though I couldn't stand the people that I was working for, and you think that doesn't happen, it absolutely does. There are people, yeah, they'll be happy to give it, well, not happy. <laughs> They're willing to give money they're willing to give their time but they have nothing but disdain for the person they're doing it for it will have done it will have availed them nothing there will be no spiritual benefit at all for having done it now the next portion of this verse is often misunderstood a lot of people have said uh, uh, that early christians sacrificed themselves by fire on behalf of others to be seen as martyrs that's not what they're talking about in daniel chapter uh, 3 verse 28 it, it, we get this idea of they give their body to be burned. Here we see an example. This is what they're talking about here. They're willing to give themselves up. And God's not asking any Christian to immolate themselves for the, for the sake of Christ. That's not what he's talking about here. But they're willing to give up their bodies to be burned. What does it say? Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants and trusted in him. And set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. But here we see that the act of delivering our bodies to be burned or delivering or offering ourselves up, being willing to suffer pain up to the point of death on behalf of Jesus Christ is commendable. And in the case of the first century Christians, in many cases it was necessary. They had no choice. But even if, we're not, even if we were to allow ourselves to be martyred for the sake of Christ, if we're not guided by a sense of love, both for God and for man, what's it going to do? It will not profit us at all. We've just lost our lives. It hasn't done anything for us. 
Love still has to be in their underpinnings, even when we suffer, even when we suffer, suffer persecution. Even when the first century Christians suffered persecutions, love still had to be at the heart of how they responded to that same persecution. It, it, it applies to us today. You know, we, we often say that Christians are under attack. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I certainly see that there are those, there are members of the Lord's church, there are Christians worldwide who are suffering persecution. I don't really count what we suffer here. I, I, I think this is something that we can handle. But there are Christians elsewhere who are being put to death for their, their, their beliefs. But you know what? Even if they're put to death for their beliefs, if, if they're still not motivated by a sense of love for God and for man, it's not going to profit them anything. And how sad would that be? How sad would that be to be a martyr, to be a martyr in name only, and not, in, not, not through our heart and soul? How sad would that be? It's not going to result in salvation, and God is not going to approve of it. So this may be difficult to hear. I mean, it certainly is sometimes when we think about all the things that we've done throughout our lives and how, how much we've been of service to God, and we realize that in those times where our heart wasn't in it literally and figuratively, our heart wasn't in there, it hasn't benefited us at all. Think about how many times we've done that. We've done it out of a sense of compunction. You know, Christ... Uh, when, when we're to give of our means, it says, give cheerfully. Not out of compunction. God loves a cheerful giver. So when we, drop that, when we drop that check in the plate and we have to sit there and pry our fingers loose of that, of, that, of that cash or that check and we put it in the plate, if that's what we're having to do, you might as well put it back in your pocket. You might as well put it back in your pocket. It's not going to do you any good. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. And it has to be at the heart of everything that we do, at the soul. At the, it's the crux of everything that we do. Now, like I said, it may be difficult to hear. Uh, it, some, some of us here may have fooled ourselves into thinking that our worship is acceptable, even though love for God and our fellow worshipers is lacking. We've pried ourselves out of bed. We come here and we, we force ourselves to sing the songs, and we're counting the moments until we can get out of here. Our worship is not acceptable to God in that, on that, in that, in that instance. We are at extremes from God. Here's God full of love because God is love. And here's us lacking love. I can't think of a greater extreme than that circumstance. And that's where we are. Some of us have put forth our offering in abundance. But it was not done in a spirit of love for God and a desire to please Him. Now the great thing about it is we can change these flaws in ourselves. We can change, these, we can change a pattern of flaws. We're not stuck in a sense of lovelessness. We're not stuck there. It's difficult sometimes. How can you make yourself love something that you just didn't think you could also actually love? I, I, I read a passage from C.S. Uh, uh, Lewis, and I, I love him as a philosopher. He says, you know, I always ask, he said, I've always asked myself, how can I love something that I didn't think was lovable? He said, this is what I do, especially when it comes to people. He said, I think about what would, how would I want to display that love towards something that I thought was unlovable? What is, the, what is something I can do to display my love for something that I thought was unlovable. I find out what that thing is that I can show my love. Even if my heart is not in it yet, I, I think of the thing that I can do to show that love, and I do that thing, whatever it might be. He said, I do that, and I make myself do it, and I make myself do it, and I make myself do it. And he said, I find myself falling into a pattern of love. It's difficult to do that for very long before you start realizing, do you know what? I think I actually do love. I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know how it manifested itself, and I think that's accurate. I think that's true. How do you show love for somebody? You show love for them. I know that sounds very easy, but it's not always that easy. I know it sounds difficult, but it's really not that difficult. If I see somebody that I didn't think I could ever be able to love, I start demonstrating my love for them in a physical way that, that, that would be visible to them. They could understand that, and I find that you'll slip into a pattern of love, not lovelessness. And that's exactly where we need to be. We find ourselves all of a sudden loving people that we didn't think were lovable. We find ourselves doing things for people that we never thought we would want to do before. And all of a sudden we find ourselves more pleasing to God because now we're engaged in the actual act of love. You know, it's great to love in our hearts, but there has to be a visible sign of it as well. That we can do a visible sign, but it also has to be in here. These two things work in conjunction with one another. Now all of a sudden we find ourselves, we're both engaging in the action and we're thinking the thoughts. We have it inside of ourselves. It's part of our soul. It's knit into us. What a beautiful thing. 
Now, all of a sudden, everything that we're doing comes through, once again, that idea of that filter of love. Everything that we're doing comes through that sense of love for one another, the sense of love for God. And now, all of the things that, we, that, we, that were great, they were great but weren't any good without love, now we have love, now they're worth something. Now I'm not nothing in the sight of God. Now I'm something in the sight of God. And God's pleased with me. He sees it and he says, this is what I'm talking to you about. This is what I want to see from you. You're doing all of the things and you have the thought behind it. This is what makes me happy. Because guess what? That's what God is. God is love. And how do we determine what's love? We compare it to what God is. That's how we do it. That's how things work. Now, God always provides instruction to his people, right? Always has. Always will. He doesn't want us to flounder around, trying to, trying to cast about, trying to see, well, what are we supposed to be doing here? I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be here. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to, how am I supposed to be acting in this regard? God always provides instruction to his people. He will not require us to do something and not give us instructions on how to accomplish that thing. Now, we're, we're not going to go, we're not going to read this, but in verses 4 through 8, it paints a picture of what love is and what love isn't. And it may be easier to understand if we just add or if we substitute Christians who love. Christians who love are long-suffering. Christians who love are patient. Christians who love are kind to others. Christians who love are Christians. Because you can't be a Christian if you don't love. Christians who love do not seek, seek what is not their own. Christians who love do not envy. Christians who love do not boast or brag of themselves. Other people are more important to them than themselves. Christians who love are not re rude or greedy. Christians who love are not easily provoked to anger. Christians who love do not think about evil things. They don't enter their mind. They think of what's good and right and proper. Christians who love are not happy with sin, but are happy to hear the truth taught because it spurs them on to better behavior. It spurs them. It, it, it pricks their heart. It causes their conscience to ache and want to be closer to God. Christians who love bear up under persecution. They believe all of the word and they hope for all of the promises of God. Christians who love, and this is the greatest one, Christians who love never fail. Never fail. They, people, people should be able to look at us and say, you know what, if everybody else falls away, I know that my brothers and sisters in Christ will not fail me. I can rely on them. They are, a, they, are, they, are a, they are a bedrock. They are a foundation. And I know I can always count on them. Verse 13 gives a fitting end to the chapter of love. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I want to consider this in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Consider the admonition and the affirmation that we find in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Okay? Here's the admonition. If you don't love, you don't know God, no matter what you say. You think you know Him, but you don't. Why? Because God is love. This is the affirmation. This is the affirmation. The admonition is, if you don't love, you don't know God. Here's the affirmation. God is love. And if you've ever wondered, I don't know if I'm showing the right kind of love, compare it to God's. What are you willing to do for your brothers and sisters in Christ? What are you willing to do for them? Are you willing to confront them in their sin? Or are you let them go their merry way and, and not, not want to upset the apple cart? Well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want them to not like me anymore. Or do I love them enough to confront them in the error that they're in so that I can may save them from their sins? I can save their souls and keep them from going to hell. I don't want them to be there. I only want them to be with me in heaven. It's an admonition and it's an affirmation. We know that God is love. Now, the question is this. Do you know God this morning? Truly know him. Because if you know him, you love him. If you love him, then you know him. Do you know the brethren? If you know him, you love them. If you love them, you know them. Do you love the lost? Here's an even, here's an even harder question to answer. Do we truly love the lost? Or do we see them as an aggravation? Do we see them as an annoyance? Do we see them as something, well, I have to put up with them until I can go home to be with God and I don't have to worry about them anymore. If you don't know God, get to know him. And get to know him this morning. Because we don't know how long we'll have. Confess his son. Repent of your sins. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're an erring Christian, regain your love for God and his creation. 
the, the people that you serve with here in this church and the people that you have to live with in the world. If you, need to, if you need to get out of that extreme, go from being nothing in the sight of God to being something in the eyes of God, we want you to make that attempt. We want you to make that effort this morning. We want to pray with you. We want to do whatever it takes to bring you in a right relationship with God. If you have the need of the prayers of the congregation, whatever we can do to make that help you initiate that, we want you to come while we stand and while we sing. Peace out for the day.